Hello. My name is Vlad, call sign Kilowatt X-Ray 4 Tango Hotel, and today I'm going to be presenting Building the Man Pack. So what is it? It is the Mobile and Novel Portable Amateur Communications Kit, as I like to call it. Uh, totally not a backronym. Uh, it's basically a IC7100 stuffed into a backpack uh, with a battery. So uh, someone a while ago had told me that uh, due to battery weight, this wasn't a practical idea. Uh, so I decided to go out and uh, try it for myself and see what I could do. Uh, so since it's based around an IC7100, it covers all bands on HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. So you can call it an all-band radio if you'd like. Uh, some of the standout features that I included in this build are a Raspberry Pi 4B Plus uh, for digital modes and a lithium iron phosphate battery. So what's inside the box, or the bag in this case? So you have an IC7100 by ICOM that will run you around $800, uh, though with discounts and mail-in rebates you can get them for seven or six hundred even if you're really lucky. Um, for VHF and UHF there is an ABRI, uh, however you pronounce that, 42 inch uh, folding dual band antenna. It's basically like two tape measures put back to back. It's a ripoff of a Harris design actually, but it's extremely convenient. Uh, as you can see in this image here, it folds uh, and you just secure it with this little Velcro strip and uh, it works excellently. It's a full half wave on two meters. Uh, so you're probably gonna see really close to two DBI realized gain, which is great uh, for a portable antenna. Uh, for HF operating portable, there's a Soviet folding Kulikov antenna, and that's pictured here. So it's quite interesting. It's basically a, a steel wire uh, that is tensioned with this mechanism here. And there's a spring and like this jack on the base. So these beads are just plastic beads. They're not ferrite or anything. This antenna is completely untuned. Uh, and when you flip that mechanism open, it tensions that steel wire and the beads stack up against each other and the antenna uh, erects straight up. And it's got some flop and bend to it, but it'll stand straight uh, and it won't like fall over on its own or anything. But extremely handy because, you know, if it hits a branch or something, it'll kind of bend in half and then pop right back up. Really useful. Um, but since it's entirely untuned, the... Most other really important thing in this bag is the ICOM AH4 automatic tuner. And those will run you probably about $300. Um, oh yes, this antenna I forgot to mention, that's an eBay special find. Uh, they ship from Ukraine, typically, actually. Uh, Soviet new old stock, I suppose. And yeah, they're pretty easy to find for like 30 bucks. Uh, so, also going to the battery, we have a whatever <laughs> milady or miati i don't know how to pronounce that chinese a 12 volt lithium iron phosphate battery for 60 dollars and it claims 16 amp hours and i actually have no reason to disbelieve that uh this battery has actually worked excellently and i do recommend it uh, if you decide to do a similar build uh, then we of course have the pi 4 4 gigabyte version a usb gps module uh, an aluminum case for the Pi, uh, we'll touch on that later, and then a DC 12 to 5 volt uh, converter uh, to give the 5 volt supply for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, then of course everything is in this roller bag, which I actually am not sure how much that cost since I actually found this bag in the garbage. <laughs> but it is a great bag for this because it's got that extending handle in the top, or the backpack straps you can wear, so it's extremely convenient uh, for for this kind of device. So there's some other miscellaneous costs involved here, uh, like coax, you know, for running uh, from this VHF antenna to the radio connectors, copper tape for shielding, Type C cables, ferrite beads, you know, all that kind of junk you don't think about. Switches, 
wires. So I had $25 for that. Um, so total is around $1,340. Uh, you you know probably plus minus a hundred bucks depending on uh, some of the other components you choose or do not choose to include. Uh, so the general layout of the bag, uh, as you can see, uh, the radio is in this main compartment here. Battery sits in the back, and then the tuners in this front here. Uh, whoop. More clearly visible here, where this part sticks out. Um, so. The Raspberry Pi is located in the side pouch. You can see the GPS module sticking out the top. Um, as you saw in the previous slide, batteries behind the radio when this is all closed up. And the control unit, uh, you can either stick it through the strap, uh, and actually when you wear it, you can see the display uh, on your shoulder, or you can Velcro it onto this top carrying handle, uh, depending on how you want to use the pack. Uh, there's extra wire with alligator clips and bullet connectors uh, stowed in here, as you can see. Uh, some general modifications that I had to make uh, were included just cutting some openings between the compartments to run cables in the bag, that is. Um, everything has ferrite beads. Everything that's crucial. Uh, copper tape, too. Um, so last important note was uh, you can see the top of the AH4 tuner, there's this SO239 connector. Uh, that's actually pretty important because the uh, AH4 tuner does not come with a connector. It is supposed to be a, uh, a balanced feed. If you're familiar with antenna design, it is supposed to be the feed port itself. The tuner is supposed to be located at the feed gap of your antenna. So this is problematic if you have any kind of feed lines, uh, because it's just not designed to do that. Um, so in this case, this connector is purely for mechanical support. Only the center pin is driven. The the outside of the connector is left floating. Um, and otherwise, uh, it, it is not a proper SO239 connector. It's there only for the convenience of the fact that I put a PL259 on the folding antenna as well. Uh, just to give myself an easy way of connecting and disconnecting that, because if you saw from this image, this actually comes with a metal jack um, that is supposed to connect into whatever Soviet radio this was designed for. Um, so, you know, that's not very convenient for me, so I just stuck a LMR600 a PL259, once again, with only the center pin soldered to the metal here, uh, purely for mechanical convenience. Um, so, aside from that, uh, this pack can also be used in a mobile installation if you'd like. So here I have some images showing uh, what I have going on in my car. I have the control unit up on some Velcro on the dash. Um, I have a little display for the Raspberry Pi and a little mouse keyboard combo. Uh, you can just throw the bag in the trunk and uh, connect it up, you know, to your battery power, the Ethernet, HDMI, and uh, of course your antennas. So I have a, a very short length of 450 ohm ladder that just runs right over to the top of the trunk to the 102 inch whip that I use for HF. And then for VHF, I use an MFJ 1432, uh, supposedly collinear type antenna. Um, I'm not going to bother putting the phasing and whatnot here, but supposedly it's 5 to 7 dBi uh, from 2 meter to 70 centimeter. Uh, probably possible, not sure how accurate that is. Uh, so of course with the ladder line, uh, the negative side, uh, I had to give it a polarity here, uh, the negative side of the line is connected to the vehicle chassis along with the tuner grip. So that, you can't see that here, but the bottom of the bag, there's a little uh, pigtail, here we go, this little ground lead uh, that goes to a connector I put on the actual chassis of the car, uh, and the ground side of the ladder connects at that same point. Uh, and then the positive side of the ladder line uses a bullet connector to stick into the middle of that uh, SO239 on the tuner, and then that goes to the actual, you know, whip section on that antenna. 
and so this is actually using a just a triple magnet mount uh stuck on the top of the trunk to mount the antenna and the other uh, the vhf antenna is on a, a lip mount uh so some other important notes here are that i have an emi filter installed at the car battery a big lc network and like 6,000 microfarads of shunt capacity uh capacitance across the power leads uh at the radio in the trunk here um noise is just a really big issue uh, from the spark plugs and the alternator uh and all that stuff really helps having the filters really really does help a lot so considerations for travel the pack is about 23 pounds as shown in this image here uh, oh, whoopsies uh, so here you can see the that kulikov antenna fully extended um so 23 pounds not so bad uh depending on how physically fit you are i suppose <laughs> i really don't think it's that bad actually um the only thing is that the wheels uh, from the roller bag aren't very comfortable on your back when hiking they kind of dig into your like uh like almost right into your kidneys it's not very pleasant uh but if you can get over that it's not terrible uh as far as actually getting this thing through airports and whatnot it's totally random uh at denver airport we had absolutely no stops and no issues uh fort myers airport in uh florida wanted me to remove the actual icom from the bag and have that separate uh and then SeaTac in seattle uh <laughs> took the bag off the uh security conveyor belt and proceeded to attempt to disassemble it rather humorously uh, with the guy, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, unplugging all my coax and ethernets and USB connections. And I started trying to walk him through it so he doesn't, you know, destroy everything. Uh, and rather humorously, he ended up just completely giving up, left it half disassembled and just pushed the bag at me and said, just like, next time, take it out of the bag. <laughs> oh, uh, your mileage may vary, but every time uh, that I did take it through an airport, we did make it through. Surprisingly, nobody ever batted an eye at the battery. Uh, so, you know, I'm pretty willing to wager that you can make it through any airport, mo most likely. Um, so, the bag is actually small enough that you can take it as a carry-on or a personal item. It'll fit under, you know, the seat or up above in the carry-on uh, compartment. Now, as for using the Raspberry Pi when not in the car, I actually uh, set up a hotspot on my phone the Pi connects to that automatically, and then I can use a VNC remote desktop type connection to just control the Pi from my phone. Uh, or like when I'm in a vehicle or if you have access to a TV and like keyboard and mouse or something, you can always just hook it up that way as well. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that GPS module, I actually use that to synchronize time uh, for FT8 because FT8, you know, cares about those 15 second intervals. Um, so it synchronizes using the standard uh, Linux NTP service. You just replace the network component with a GPS. It's pretty simple. There's tutorials out there on how to do that. Uh, works just fine. Uh, only thing I'll note is with these cheap uh, USB GPS dongles, um, getting them to synchronize it can take a little while and they need really like pretty open sky conditions. They'll sync inside, but definitely issues inside like metal buildings and whatnot it just does not work as well as like a gps on your phone for example um so having said all that at least the internet isn't required to have accurate time and location it works just fine so uh noise issues this is something i kind of touched on with the ferrites and the copper tape uh and the aluminum case i mentioned earlier and it's a big problem uh, it's especially a problem in the car, but also just within the bag itself, like the Raspberry Pi uh, seems to radiate a lot of noise down, I I'm guessing, the shield of the power line. Uh, no amount of uh, reactants there seem to save me from getting one or two S units on some bands. It's kind of specific, like, it's one to two S units on two meters, under one S unit on two, 
uh, excuse me, one to two S units on 10 meters, under one, one S unit on two, and uh, just full bar S9 on 70 centimeters. I'm guessing some sort of USB or HDMI or some sort of communications happening on that frequency that just QRMs everything. So that's something to keep in mind. Maybe something that could be solved by having a totally decoupled power system for the uh, Pi, like a separate battery. Um, it would be quite annoying, in my opinion. Uh, but something that might resolve that. But something to keep in mind there. Um, so I, I have tried some isolation techniques. Like I said, that isolation, there's an EMI filter in the bag as well. I had a opto coupler for the USB connection to the radio as well. Um, that all seemed to help a little bit, uh, but didn't, you know, entirely resolve the issue. Uh, like I said, for the mobile install, definitely recommend EMI filters, uh, you know, on the battery. Uh, they really do help a lot. Uh, but the Raspberry Pi, uh, even though it's an aluminum case, I wrapped it entirely in copper tape. Did the same thing for as many cables as I could, put ferrite beads on absolutely all the connections, um, tried to kind of RF seal everything as much as possible. And for example, wrapping that pie in the copper tape actually helped a lot, uh, but still the, there's still some noise. It's hard to isolate exactly where it's coming from at this point. Um, so what are my results with this? Uh, there's lots of small kinks to work out. Uh, mainly the wiring harness inside you saw was kind of a mess. Uh, charging it is a little bit inconvenient. Um, but aside from that, it actually works quite well. Uh, the battery easily lasts for an, over an hour of use uh, with anywhere from 50 to 100 watts transmit. Uh, that's probably with a transmit duty cycle of anywhere between like 10 and 30 percent probably. Uh, you know, I don't try to yap that much on the air. I tend to listen more. Uh, so, uh, of course, it will tune that 102 inch whip from 80 meters through 6 meters, no problem at all. I've made contacts on all those bands mobile. Uh, it'll tune that Kulikov antenna with this little uh, rat tail you see here uh, from 40 meters through 6 meters. Uh, of course, we're not talking about efficiency here. I have no idea what the actual radiation resistance is or, you know, what the actual system gain is i just know that it'll tune it uh but aside from that uh i've made plenty of contacts uh on mobile all the bands that it tunes i've worked uh voice and uh, digital uh portable like physically walking with the bag on my back with that kulikov i've made some contacts on 10 meter upper side band uh, to the carolinas running about uh, 20 watts um, and next, we'll talk about my portable operations in Colorado, Oregon, and Washington. So, uh, I took this pack with me to Colorado Springs, and I worked several stations on 2 meters uh, and 6 meter, uh, both repeaters and simplex for 2 meter. Uh, I worked from Cave of the Winds from the outside uh, to the downtown with 10 watts. Uh, that was rather fun. I also connected to a packet BBS and a Winlink node from my hotel room, as pictured here. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, having the antenna H-pole like this worked a little bit better. Um, so, uh, the, as you can see, I had that Kulikov set up and uh, worked just fine on 6 meters. Okay, sorry about that uh, pause. I actually had to go jump on a two meter net, so I had to stop the recording for a little bit. Um, also, while I was doing that, I realized that my camera's been blocking some of the figures here, so before I move on, I'm just gonna jump back through uh, here, move myself, there we go. Uh, now you can see that uh, ground lead coming from the rig, which you couldn't see before, <laughs> as well as uh, this image, you can see a little bit more clearly. Um, so you see some of the labels. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the cat is not included in the bill of materials. Alright, so let's, having said that, let's move back on. Um, 
So I mentioned how I was able to do 2 meter and 6 meter in Colorado Springs. Uh, this picture here, by the way, let me move myself again. Uh, this is the Cheyenne Mountain uh, antenna farm, if you will. This is visible from anywhere in the Colorado Springs area. And I mean, you can see a lot of towers here, but it's something about it's even more impressive in person. It's kind of crazy <laughs> how many of those things are up there. And at night, uh, all these lights on the towers uh, flicker and flash, and they look like a UFO in the dark. I remember coming in from Denver the first time I saw the mountain. I was like, what the hell is all that? Like, I could not tell what was going on there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was rather amused when the next day, uh, when I woke up and I looked outside and I was like, oh my god, that was a bunch of towers. Uh, it was pretty funny. Any, anyhow, uh, after Colorado, we went up to, uh, 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 Washington is where I operated next. And, uh, I took my bag, uh, the man pack up on a hike two and a half miles up Mount Eleanor in Olympic Ma National Park. Uh, so here, you can see we started at this uh, lower trailhead here, and we went up uh, to where this red marker is. So basically, like, up this ridge, um, you can't really see the trail. Uh, what you see here are the roads that actually lead up to it. Um, so yeah, uh, this was a pretty epic hike. We weren't able to make it all the way to the top of the mountain here, uh, because we're not... We're not professional hikers or anything like that. And I was carrying this, you know, 23 pound bag. I didn't want to push it. So we stopped at this uh, big boulder in this kind of small clearing in the woods. Um, and uh, it was a pretty incredible hike. You can actually see uh, this uh, next to the keeper. Uh, you can see this gap in the trees. And there were, we were up above the clouds at this point. We actually walked through them up on that hike. And you can kind of see the valley between the mountains here. It was a really stunning view so I worked for about an hour um, stations on uh, six meters uh, worked a six meter repeater uh, I did simplex on 20 and 40 uh, and uh, we only spent an hour because it was actually really cold up there you would not believe how cold it was it was a uh, like probably 40 degrees or so where we stopped here uh, and it was 56 degrees at the lower trailhead when we got out of the car uh, that was according to the car uh, didn't have a thermometer or anything with me up there, but it was very cold. Uh, I imagine, you know, probably below freezing up at the top. It'll give you an idea of the gradient there. Um, but basically I had set up with um, uh, that additional wire uh, that I had in the bag. So I, I unfolded the Kulikov. You can see it. I stuck it on the top of the tuner. And then I all alligator clipped uh, some more wire to the top of that Kulikov antenna. And I threw it about 10 feet up into a, a fir tree behind us. Um, so I still had the end coiled up, so it probably had like a an inductively top-loaded vertical. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, this ground wire, of course, uh, clipped into the bottom of the tuner, and I threw that out probably some 25 feet off the side of the boulder. You can kind of see that line uh, running up here. Uh, so that worked fairly well. Um, the ionosphere wasn't amazing that day. Uh, it also wasn't uh, terrible either. Unfortunately, the closest Digisond uh, that I could get a uh, ionospheric sounding from was in Idaho. So it's, uh, you know, not 100% accurate. But here you can kind of see that the uh, uh, muff at NVIS was like 3.18 megahertz. So, you know just about uh 80 meters maybe uh, of course you know at higher angles you know you could get up to 16 megahertz for a hop of uh, 3,000 kilometers uh so it was workable um but could have been better one thing i will mention was the noise floor was absolutely stunning i, I had both preamps on the the ic7100 has a two-stage preamp i don't know what the exact gain is of each stage but I could have the preamp on full swing, preamp 2, and still have hardly S1 of noise. Like, it would just barely tickle the meter. So, the noise floor was incredible. Um, and uh, thanks to that, in part, I was able to make some contact. So, I'll go ahead and uh, pause that and uh, see if I can play some of this for you.
exit and see if this works. Oh, okay. Or, okay, so I guess <laughs> it messed up the formatting here, but uh, we'll start with uh, this contact with WA6PEP in California. Or actually, go. we'll go ahead and uh, just play KA7GKN uh, because he did a fun signal replay for us, so I won't bore you with the other ones. The uh, Portable 4, go ahead, KA7GKN in Arizona. Okay, KA7GKN, this is Kilowatt X-Ray 4 Tango Hotel, portable in Olympic National Park, Washington, at the base of Mount Eleanor. Over. You're very light into Arizona. Band conditions are very poor. Are you running low power? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm running 1,400 watts to uh, four elements on 20 meters at 70 feet, so that's going to make the difference. You're about S3 here, and my noise level is just about S3 also. Okay, QSL. Uh, well, uh, I appreciate you coming back to me. I didn't want to interrupt your conversation, but I figured I'd try to catch a strong station while I could here. Portable, over. All right, tell you what, uh, give me a second here to hit a couple of switches and uh, see if I can uh, increase your signal with respect to the noise level to make a recording. Give me a rundown on your station. Uh, QSL, yeah, I'm uh, operating a man pack, basically a backpack here with an IC7100, uh, and I've got a wire going probably about 10 feet up into a tree, and then a ground wire running down this rock here. We're probably at about 5,000 feet or so elevation on this boulder, over. Okay, all right. You're going to hear a lot of, in the background, a lot of received static noise, uh, but you might be able to hear yourself. Here it comes. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for that playback. I, I could actually copy myself uh, through the whole circuit there. That's pretty great. Uh, neat feature there. Thank you very much. All right. So there you could hear it. Uh, so you heard him tell me I was a bit light. And that seemed to be the general consensus from uh, most of the stations that I talked to. Uh, once again, probably conditions weren't so good. But yeah, I was running anywhere between 50 and 100 watts and... Uh, it worked, and uh, honestly, I'm happy with that. Uh, that's I, I proved the point, I suppose. So uh, it works. Uh, like I said, if you're interested, uh, Bill of Materials is uh, right here. You can pause, take a look, see what I put in here. Uh, but yeah, uh, for about $1,300, you can have a totally usable uh, multi-band a uh, portable radio that you can also install as mobile so that you don't have uh, separate rigs. That uh, money adds up real quick. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And I hope you'll come back again for uh, whatever uh, junk I feel like uploading next. Thanks for watching.